This video is brought to you by friend of the channel Squarespace. Stick around to learn more about them as well as a special offer they're making available through my channel. Gamers, hello and welcome to the only YouTube channel not providing a running commentary on Amazon's new Rings of Power TV show. I feel like I need a break from capital D discourse after having reviewed The Last of Us Part 1. Man, that was just as wild a ride as I expected. I'm a simple man and instead of partaking in the zeitgeist, I've been re-watching The Sopranos for the sixth time and playing too much Destiny 2. Please don't judge me, it's, it's a really good season. Outside of that, I've just been staying on top of the news. All of this Microsoft acquisition drama, the Callisto Protocol crunch story, this disappointing Halo Infinite news, that one was very rough. Never a dull moment in this business, so let's get to it. Here comes the news. Let's talk about that Halo story first, since that certainly dominated the conversation this week. Halo Infinite is not doing so well. After a fantastic launch with a well-received campaign and some absolutely brilliant PvP sandbox fundamentals, the player base quickly became frustrated with the absence of key features missing from multiplayer, stuff like playlists for Slayer and a progression system that didn't suck and a cash shop that wasn't a total ripoff, etc. Over time, those complaints would intensify owing to the glacially slow pace of updates. Halo Infinite was positioned as a live service, and while that is a new delivery model for Halo, sort of, it's not a new model for the game's industry. Fortnite, Apex, Genshin, Destiny, and loads more have all nailed the live service model, and that's what people expect at this point, especially from a flagship franchise like Halo and a developer as well-resourced as 343. Despite this, things have been moving really slowly. We're only on Season 2 now, despite the game having been released some 10 months ago. There's a real dearth of new maps and modes. There's some key technical issues holding the game back, and the player base has stagnated, sitting at around 5k peak concurrent players on Steam daily. Compare that to, say, Apex, Legends, which has around 450,000 peak concurrent players on Steam at the moment. Apex Legends is literally 100 times more popular than Halo. Kind of crazy when you put it that way. That brings us to this week's update, where 343 revealed that the map maker tool Forge is coming along really well. It's looking very ambitious, and it's definitely going to breathe some new life into the game. It is arriving before the end of the year. The flip side, though, is that the next season is being delayed until March next year. That means the current season will run for 10 months, an absolutely absurd length of time in the context of live service delivery. The other thing they announced was a real shocker. Couch co-op? It's been cancelled. That was after 343 swore black and blue that no future Halo game would ship without couch co-op, declaring it a flagship franchise feature. Not so much, I guess. And the craziest thing about that announcement is that someone figured out that couch co-op is already in the game. A workaround found by someone named Zenny on Twitter showed that you could boot up couch co-op on the Series X and it worked fine. Like, what? What? Why would you cancel this if it already works? I mean, I'm sure there's a reason for it. So 343, if you could please explain that, that would be great. This is very confusing. The delays, the cancellations, and the lack of content all led to the hashtag Fire343 to start trending on Twitter, as many were arguing that 343 has had their chance with Halo, and it was time to give it to another developer, perhaps one of the Activision studios if Microsoft's acquisition deal goes through. So here's what I think. I really want the employees of 343 to have a job and be okay. I don't want to see any of them get fired because we aren't happy with Halo. But at the same time, this studio was founded in 2007, 14 years ago, with the express purpose of stewarding the Halo franchise. Many people say it's not fair to judge Halo Infinite yet. We need to give 343 more time to stand up the live service elements. This game has been in development for seven years, more probably, and 343 have had this franchise for 14 years. Look at where it is now. Halo 4 was not great. The Master Chief Collection was a disaster at launch. Halo 5 was very bad. Halo Infinite's campaign was very middling. And the multiplayer side of things, outside of those awesome sandbox fundamentals, the content, the modes, the whatever, all of that is quite dire in the context of what the market is delivering elsewhere. I look at Guerrilla Studios. That is a studio that was forced to churn out Killzone games for several years, and some of them were okay, and some of them completely sucked. And then Sony just let them make whatever they wanted to make. And then we got Horizon Zero Dawn. I would love to see Microsoft set 343 free and let them try their hand at something else, in part because I think it would be good to let them flex their muscle outside of this franchise, but also because I don't think they're the right studio for this franchise at this point. And I think it would be good to give another studio a shot at it. Anyway, that's my take. Let me know what you think below. Changing gears now, let's talk about a game that was directly inspired by Halo's sandbox, Splitgate. This arrived on the scene back in 2019, and it really didn't make much of an impact. 
Two years later though, the game was picked up by a handful of streamers and then it absolutely exploded, completely taking over the competitive shooter scene for a brief window. Those developers were smart. They struck while the iron was hot and secured a boatload of additional funding for their studio, which was to be reinvested in the game. That is happening, but not in quite the way we imagined. This week, the developers took to Twitter to announce that they were essentially wrapping up development on Splitgate so they could focus on a new game. Quote, After careful consideration and much deliberation, the 1047 Games team has determined that in order to build the game fans deserve and to build it in a way that isn't trying to retrofit and live operate an existing product, we are ending featured development of Splitgate. We're turning our attention away from iterative smaller updates and going all in to focus on a new game in the Splitgate universe, which will present revolutionary, not evolutionary, changes to our game. It will be a shooter, it will have portals, it will be built in Unreal Engine 5, oh, and it'll be free." End quote. This is a pretty good move, I think. Splitgate is a very cool concept and it plays really well, but it does look a little dated at this point. And with all the money these guys have secured, what better way to spend it than on a rebuilt Splitgate experience? Future proof thanks to Unreal Engine 5. It's no doubt some years away, but it feels like the sort of thing worth waiting for. Best of luck to the dev team. It's always nice to see indie projects achieve this sort of success. Hey, let's check in on that whole Microsoft Activision Blizzard acquisition mess. Oh boy, I really thought we'd seen the back of this, like no more drama, no more leaked emails or submissions full of juicy details. Turns out I was wrong. This week, the UK Competition and Markets Authority, their industry watchdog, has determined that the acquisition deal should be subject to further scrutiny owing to the fact that it may affect competition in the United Kingdom. As a result, the deal will be subject to a more intensive Phase 2 investigation unless Microsoft and Activision Blizzard can, quote, offer acceptable undertakings to address these competition concerns, end quote. Oh boy, Jim Ryan licking his chops at all this. The news prompted Uncle Phil to get on the charm offensive. In a blog post titled Gaming for Everyone Everywhere, Phil sought to put minds at ease about the potential acquisition by promoting the accessibility of Xbox's platform and services, saying that they plan to focus on mobile in order to reach more players, and they'll put major IPs like Overwatch, Diablo, and Call of Duty on Game Pass, making those titles easier to play than ever before. He also reiterated what he said earlier about Call of Duty remaining a multi-platform game supporting crossplay, but he's notably never put a time frame on that, which is a curious exemption when talking about exclusivity windows. The plot thickened days later when Tom Warren of The Verge dropped a bombshell report saying that Phil Spencer had sent an email to to Jim Ryan of Sony, saying that Call of Duty would remain a multi-platform game for, quote, several more years, end quote. That is a very, very unspecific time frame. What is several? Two? Five? Seven? It's almost never seven. The clearest implication that can be drawn from this is that Call of Duty will, at some point, become an Xbox exclusive, which probably isn't what regulators want to hear at this stage of the proceedings. Both Phil Spencer and Bobby Kotick have made public utterances that the regulatory approval process is going ahead as expected, but you do have to wonder how much this level 2 inquiry might throw a spanner in the works. Speaking of acquisitions, there were some other ones this week. It looks like David Cage got his wish because his studio, Quantic Dream, has been acquired by Chinese-based NetEase, best known for Diablo Immortal. Love it. Cage is the creative behind Heavy Rain, Beyond Two Souls, and the more recent Detroit Become Human, ever a controversial figure in ways too numerous to fully recount, the most recent one being that his studio was accused by two French newspapers of having a toxic workplace environment and protecting abusive upper management, a lawsuit that Quantic Dream won without disproving the allegations against them. Right now, the studio is hard at work on a Star Wars title, but word on the street is it's not going super well, mainly due to the fact that they can't hire or retain staff. As such, the estimated release date for the title is somewhere in the vicinity of 2027. Ouch. Best of luck, Netties. This is a very risky purchase. The other acquisition wasn't an acquisition per se, rather just an investment, but it's an interesting one. Small time, up and coming, hidden gem indie dev from software are really turning heads lately. Their most recent release, Elden Ring, has sold a moderate number of copies and it's got some pretty good review scores too. Good job, team. Keep it up. FromSoft may be unknown to you and I, but they're certainly not unknown to Tencent and Sony, who this week bought a big fat chunk of them. Together, they acquired about 30% of the Japanese-based developer, with the split favoring Tencent and the purchase price in the vicinity of 260 million US dollars. Miyazaki says he plans to invest the money in FromSoft's upcoming NFT project, to which gamers responded, What the fuck? I love NFTs now. They're like the Dark Souls of JPEGs. 
I'm joking. Thankfully, Miyazaki does not fuck with NFTs, at least as far as we know. FromSoft say the money will be put towards future ambitious projects. That is awesome. They also talk about taking the Elden Ring franchise beyond the realm of just video games. That too is awesome. There have been questions asked about whether or not this might indicate that future FromSoft titles would be PlayStation exclusive. That's not impossible, see Bloodborne, but if that does occur, it would be a separate agreement that is only tangentially related to this ownership deal. Given how well Elden Ring has sold across all platforms, I think it's unlikely that FromSoft are gonna wanna go back down the platform exclusive path again. Hey, let's do that Callisto Protocol story now. Real bummer this one, because to this point, there's been nothing but unequivocal, uncomplicated hype for this game. It's the team who made the original Dead Space, or at least some of them. They got screwed over by EA, but they managed to regroup, form their own studio, and they make it a spirit spiritual success at Dead Space, while EA are working on a remake of Dead Space. Everyone was pulling for these guys since it's a comeback story, it's an underdog story, and it doesn't hurt that the game looks absolutely fantastic. Enter Glenn Schofield, who in a moment of what I can only assume was the giddiness that comes from extreme exhaustion, tweeted this out, quote, I only talk about the game during an event. We're working six to seven days a week. Nobody's forcing us. Exhaustion, tired, COVID, but we're working. Bugs, glitches, performance fixes, one last pass through audio. 12 to 15 hour days, this is gaming. Hard work, lunch, dinner, working, you do it because you love it, end quote. This was a very bad tweet. It was a studio boss effectively glorifying crunch at a time when the industry is very alive to this sort of stuff and has very little tolerance for it. If it were happening, but he wasn't crowing about it, that would be bad enough. But for him to openly celebrate a culture that has people working through meals, working through COVID, Dude, this one should have stayed in the drafts. The backlash was immediate and immense with both fans and the media putting him on blast. He quickly deleted the tweet and issued a follow up saying, quote, anyone who knows me knows how passionate I am about the people I work with. Earlier, I tweeted how proud I was of the effort and hours the team was putting in. That was wrong. We value passion and creativity, not long hours. I'm sorry to the team for coming across like this, end quote. It must be said that to this point, there haven't been reports of crunch or a hostile work environment at Striking Distance Studios, but this sort of tweet does imply a management culture where that sort of thing would be possible. Ideally, it'd be good to hear directly from Striking Distance staff themselves about whether or not crunch is happening. And if it is, just delay the game. We're still gonna buy it, even if it releases after the Dead Space remake, okay? This looks good, and if a delay protects workers, then a delay is always the right choice. Just please don't delay it into February, okay? We'll talk more about that later. Here's something interesting. Turns out Arkane really didn't want to call their game Prey, and it kind of led to Arkane's founder to lead the studio. Rafael Colantonio was being interviewed by the Academy of Interactive Arts and Sciences, and during that he said that Bethesda's management forced the name on him, and then he found it, quote, very, very hurtful, end quote, and that that was the thing that sealed the deal in his decision to leave the studio. Quote, I'm grateful that a company will give me the means to make a game and trust my ability with so many millions of dollars. I'm grateful for that, but there is a bit of the artistic, creative side that is insulted when you tell this artist your game is going to be called Prey. You go like, I don't think it should. I think it's a mistake. It's a sales mistake because we're going to get the backfires from the original Prey fans. These ones are not going to be happy. Then the ones who didn't like Prey, they're not even going to look for our game. They're not going to find our game, end quote. He wasn't wrong. The game met a hostile reception owing to its awkward and cynical co-opting of the name for no discernible reason. But hearing this kind of makes it a little bit better in a way. At least you know it was the work of brain dead upper management at Bethesda HQ, and not the talented people who work at Arcane, one of the best studios in the industry. Let's touch base quickly with two of the biggest in development Microsoft exclusives. The first is Fable, currently being worked on by Forza Development Playground Games. Head of Microsoft Studios, Matt Booty, great name by the way, I never get tired of saying that one. He says he wants to show us Fable because it looks so damn good, but Playground Games won't let him because they want to wait until it's ready. Quote, Part of my job is giving air cover to the team. They don't want to show stuff early before it's ready to go. But if there's one game where that's kind of flipped around, where every time I see something, I say, we should show this, it's Fable, because there's lots of cool stuff. That being said, the team has made it very clear that I'm not going to be able to show anything until it's ready, end quote. That is encouraging. Playground are a fantastic studio who have essentially conquered the racing genre this past generation, and it'll be great to see them step into a new creative space. Finally, Perfect Dark. This one is in trouble, but not if you ask Matt Booty. You might remember that this was initially going to be delivered by the world's first quadruple A studio, The Initiative. 
but a raft of departures and some project management issues have necessitated the inclusion of Crystal Dynamics into the mix, and it's rumored that they've essentially taken over management of the project at this point. Booty dismissed this, saying, quote, We just did this big partnership with Crystal Dynamics, and I've read online that this must mean there's a problem. It's quite the opposite. You've got this veteran team at Crystal Dynamics and a big AAA team with over 100 people that become available. Of course we want to work with them, particularly if they've made a game like that before, end quote. It's worth noting that Video Games Chronicle head Andy Robertson took to Twitter to refute this assertion, saying that he has definitely heard about plenty of problems at the initiative, namely cultural ones leading to an exodus of staff. So yeah, you might say that Perfect Dark's development is far from perfect. <laughs> So, what got announced or delayed this week? Well, it's official, we're getting another Assassin's Creed game, except this time it has actual assassins in it. Yo, what the fuck? That's right, after essentially ignoring everyone for like five years, Ubisoft is maybe, sorta, hopefully taking the franchise back to its roots with the newly announced Assassin's Creed Mirage, a new entry in the series set to launch sometime early next year. This may well be the last standalone Assassin's Creed game though, as Ubisoft are currently at work on Assassin's Creed Infinite, the live service Assassin's Creed that never ends. Details are scarce about Mirage and will stay that way until the title is officially unveiled at Ubisoft's next webinar showcase scheduled for later this week. For now though, we know it is set in the Middle East and will star Basim, the assassin who briefly featured in Valhalla, and the rumor mill indicates that this entry won't be a sprawling RPG, but rather a tighter, more focused stealth game. Sign me up for that. I think the new Assassin's Creed games have plenty going for them, but they aren't really Assassin's Creed games anymore. They're just big, historically themed open world RPGs with a few AC decals slapped on them for good measure. A storyline focused on the assassins, gameplay focused on actual stealth, a campaign that doesn't run for 900 hours. These things would all be music to my ears, and I hope they're all true. We'll find out later this week during Ubisoft Forward. Hey, this looks pretty cool. <laughs> Submit your application resume references and blood samples today. This is Stick It to the Stick Man, the next big thing from indie label Devolver Digital. Right now, we don't have too much to go on other than a trailer that shows off some very slick looking animations and it describes itself as a roguelike action brawler. You can unlock the Hadouken in this game, unsure what Capcom's lawyers have to say about that one. Devolver have an alarmingly high success rate when it comes to picking winners and this one definitely has some winning energy. No day for this one yet, but if you'd like to check it out, be sure to wishlist it. By the way, if you want to know more more about Devolver and how it's managed to get where it is, we're actually interviewing one of the co-founders this week on the Friends Per Second podcast. Graham Struthers joins us as well as Washington Post contributor Gene Park and we're going to be talking about a whole bunch of stuff from Hotline Miami to Fall Guys to the company going public and much more. If you're keen, then be sure to subscribe to this channel or subscribe to the Friends Per Second podcast on your podcast platform of choice. I'll leave a link to all of that below the like button. All right, back to the announcements, Lost Eidolons. Now, I played this during the recent Steam Next Fest and it was really good. It's very much Fire Emblem, but for PC and without the anime vibe, but the production values are really high for an indie title and I really like the gameplay and yeah, this could be cool. It just got an official release date, October 13th, exclusive to PC, at least for now. So this next one isn't an announcement, per se, more of an observation from a keen-eyed Redditor. We know that IO Interactive, makers of the Hit Hitman series, geez, Hit Hitman sounds like an anime. Anyway, we know that IO are working on both a James Bond game and a new IP called Project Dragon. Redditor Awkward96 looked at the company's recent financial reports and noted that IO were warning investors about depressed profits over the next two years owing to no major releases, indicating that both projects won't arrive until after 2025. By that stage, we should have a new New James Bond. That'd be cool. Please not Tom Holland though. He's already Spider-Man and Nate Drake. He He's full up, okay? He's busy. Maybe Chris Pratt. I, th I hear he's free. <laughs> anyway, one last delay announcement for the week and it isn't too surprising. Sons of the Forest has been delayed to 2023. The title has been sitting on an amorphous October release date for some time now and the closer we got to that month without the announcement of an actual date, the more likely it became that a delay would materialize. Sure enough, the developers confirmed this week that the sequel to the cult classic survival game will ship in, you guessed it, February next year, February 23rd to be precise. The prophecy is coming to pass. February now has Deliver Us Mars 2, 
Dead Island 2, Hogwarts Legacy, Sons of the Forest, and Destiny 2 Lightfall. Every week I tell publishers to stop doing this, and every week a new game gets delayed into February. This is like a freight train coming at me really, really slowly, and I am powerless to get out of the way. There is nothing that can be done. February will ruin us all. Tune in next week for more delay announcements. So what came out last week? Well, it was a big week and we did cover off a few things in last week's episode since a few review embargoes were up. If you'd like to know how Destroy All Humans 2 reprobed or Tiny Kin landed, then I'll leave a link to last week's episode below the like button. Spoiler, Destroy All Humans was fine and Tiny Kin is apparently superb. I've heard nothing but great things about that one. F1 Manager 2022 hit the shelves this week. It's apparently pretty good since it's sitting at a strong 78 on Open Critic and a mostly positive 71% on Steam. Gaming Bolt scored it a 7 out of 10 saying quote F1 Manager 22 does a decent job learning from other management simulations but only rarely feels like a step forward for the genre end quote the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtle Cowabunga collection is 13 classic Turtles games in one retro inspired package it landed this week and it did not drop the ball Steam reviews have it at a very positive 82% and critics are equally impressed putting it at a strong 80 the original games still hold up but apparently the emulation and online features aren't as good as they could be IGN scored this one a 7 and said, quote, Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles The Cowabunga Collection is a treasure trove of turtle games, but our online experience was barely functional when matchmaking. Couch co-op fares a lot better, but some may notice an increased input delay over the originals. All said, this is still a great collection for fans, end quote. Immortality dropped on the 30th, the latest from master game maker Sam Barlow. It's apparently as good as everyone was hyping it up to be, though there is a notable divide between the critic and user score. Steam users put this at a very strong 81% while critics have it at a rare and mighty 91 on open critic PC gamer scored this one a 95 saying quote immortality is Sam Barlow's best most thought-provoking game yet and a barnstorming debut for half mermaid end quote game spew were much cooler on it scoring it a 7 and saying quote it's also perhaps one of the purest examples of video games as art we've seen to date a piece of art about artists does this make for an enjoyable experience not always at times it's drawn out boring a chore even as you obsess over every bit of footage available to you but are we glad we played it absolutely end quote i'm yet to play this one but i'm very keen to do so if you'd like to check it out then don't forget it is available on game pass for both pc and xbox scathe is that doom like shooter with a bullet hell co-op twist it looked nice in the previews but it doesn't seem to have delivered outside of the presentation factor it's sitting at a mixed 53 on steam with a lot of the reviews pointing to a raft of design difficulty and ammo economy issues that should have been ironed out before release critics were equally meh about it putting it at a weak 62 on open critic tech raptor were not happy scoring the game a 4.5 out of 10 and saying quote while the gameplay concept of a labyrinthine shooter holds some promise the gunplay is flat mowing through enemies is extremely tedious on top of this graphics and some technical issues make scathe feel rather rough around the edges end quote might be one to check back in on after a few months of bug fixes and balance passes have rolled through jojo's bizarre adventure all-star battle r dropped last week as well not much to say about this remake other than that people are happy with it 83 percent very positive on steam 75 from critics the same cannot be said for the other remake released last week, The Last of Us Part 1. The remake, sort of, of Naughty Dog's opus after it was remastered for the PS4 and released on PS3 less than 10 years ago. So, predictably, the discourse around this was not great. My video, for example, sits at a 20% dislike ratio. Haven't had one of those in a while. The comment section is also... It's, it's a lot. It's a lot, okay? Not surprising given that many people feel like this $70 price tag on a game that's already been remastered is too steep. And I totally get that. That's very much why in my review I was like, look, you decide for yourself what this is worth to you. It's not worth the price tag to me because I don't love The Last of Us as much as other people do. But for fans of the game, I expect they're actually going to be pretty happy with this because the visual uplift here is gigantic. The game looks stunning now. The improvements to combat are minor, but they can certainly be felt and the accessibility options are industry leading. So that was my take. Many gaming outlets agreed, which is why the game sits at a mighty 88 on Open Critic. But even then, most of the commentary conceded that this is a remake that probably didn't need to exist. There were some real hot takes in the mix though, which is kind of rare for games media. It's usually the YouTubers who are the number one source of hot takes, but games media stepped up this time. For example, Survivor scored a 6.5 saying, quote, this is like an old PC game that gets an HD texture pack by a modder, except it's already happened officially from Sony on PS4 and is again happening now. And you're paying a premium for it each and every time, end quote. 
Metro Central had an interesting one, quote, a completely pointless remake of one of the best games of the last decade, except with only half the content and double the price, end quote. Their score? 8 out of 10. <laughs> like, what the fuck, man? <laughs> YouTubers did not disappoint, though. For example, Angry Joe just re-uploaded his original Last of Us review from back in the day, which I got to say is pretty funny. Well played, Joe. So look, I will say that it's just kind of a bummer that it all went down the way that it did. If Sony had just dropped the price a little or provided an upgrade path, then they would have sidestepped so much of this vitriol. Even though I think this is a worthwhile product in many aspects, it's also undeniably a really big black eye for Sony at a time when they're already struggling with their messaging and positioning this generation. I think they'd be very silly to ignore the feedback they've gotten on this one. And you have to wonder how this whole fiasco will influence influence future pricing decisions for remakes or remasters or whatever you want to call this. So what's coming out this week? You all remember Temtem? It burst on the scene nearly two years ago in early access and showed us a vision of what Pokemon could be like if Game Freak actually tried. Some evolved systems, some updated visuals, seamless co-op multiplayer and a bunch of other stuff. And this was just in the first phase of early access. Since then, the game has received multiple updates and is shipping 1.0 on all platforms today. If you love your pocket monster video games, I implore you to give this one a shot. There's a lot here and I don't think you'll be disappointed. Bloomwood is one that I've had on my radar for a while now. It comes from retro label New Blood Interactive, who have a fantastic strike rate at this point. The demo for this during the recent Steam Next Fest was excellent. It's an immersive sim at a time when the genre is kind of dying out, so it's a release well worth supporting. It's hitting early access today, exclusive to the PC. Circus Electric is an interesting looking one. It's a turn-based RPG, but it has a Victorian era circus steampunk automaton mashup thing going on. Haven't seen anything that looks quite like this before. It's hitting all platforms today. Disney's Dreamlight Valley. I swear this one kind of snuck up on us. It was revealed during a recent Nintendo Direct and it's now out on all platforms, including Game Pass, which I was very surprised about because this has very strong Nintendo exclusive vibes. This is essentially Stardew Valley, except instead of random villager folk, it's Disney characters like Scar from The Lion King and Sebastian, the Jamaican lobster from The Little Mermaid and Mickey Mouse and Iron Man and Obi Wan and Ghost. No, I'm joking. They're not. They're not in it. But that would be super cool if they were. Here's another one that really snuck up on us: Steel Rising. Man, I'll admit I totally forgot about this one. This is the next thing from Spiders, the team who gave us Greedfall. Now, given how well Greedfall did commercially, I would have expected their next title would have a lot more marketing pump behind it. But I swear I've heard absolutely nothing about this title since its announcement last year. It's Souls-like, I think, and it too has that automaton motif. Now, it looks cool, but I do wonder if the lack of marketing is indicative of something. I guess we'll find out when reviews drop. The game is hitting all platforms bar the Switch on the 8th. And finally, the biggest release of the week is Splatoon 3, the next installment in Nintendo's surprisingly successful PvP shooter thing, where children are also squids and they need to spray each other with ink or something. The sequel does feature both PvP and a meaty PvE component. It's obviously exclusive to the Switch and it's out on the 9th. Hey, put this on your radar. You guys remember Dark? It was a creepy puzzle adventure game with a Tim Burton-esque art style and some fantastic atmosphere. The developer gained some fame back then for publicly turning down an Epic Games exclusive deal at a time when hostility to Epic's push was running red hot. Well, that developer is back with his next thing, Bloody Hell Hotel. And this is not an Australian themed title as the name would rightly suggest, but it is a hotel management sim with easily the best art style I've ever seen in a management sim. Renovate, decorate and manage your hotel all in first person and don't forget to fend off the undead hordes who have taken up residence in your basement since nothing is going to tank your Expedia rating faster than your guests being eaten in their sleep. Bloody Hell Hotel doesn't have a release date yet, but if you'd like to wishlist it, you can do that. That always helps developers out in a big way. If you want to do that, I'll leave a link to it over on my Steam Curator page, which also has links to all of the put this on your radar stuff I've covered in the past. I'll leave a link to all of that below the like button. Sort of free stuff time now, and we are at the start of a new month, which means it's time to get paid or at least get a lot of sort of free stuff. And I gotta tell you, this month, as far as month goes, this is definitely one of the better ones. Some really awesome stuff here. So let's start out with Old Mate Epic first. Right now, you can still grab some in-game items for free-to-play dodgeball brawler Knockout City. 
You can get nautical themed exploration game Submerged Hidden Depths. And you can also get Shadow of the Tomb Raider, the concluding chapter in Crystal Dynamics rebooting of the seminal PS1 era title. Grab those quick though, because later this week they'll disappear, replaced by some in-game items for Realm Royale Reforged, which I think is that Paladin's Battle Royale game. The other one is 100 Days, which is a winemaking simulator. If Power Wash Simulator was a little too working class for your taste, then hopefully this will be bougie enough for you. The Game Pass refresh has been live for a little while now. Major callouts include Immortality, Immortal Phoenix Rising, Grid Legends, Tiny Kin, and Death Stranding. They said it would never come to Xbox, and they were sort of right, but it is on Game Pass for PC at least. Games with Gold is back, and as always, it's a bit of a mixed bag. Gods Will Fall is not great, but rhythm game Double Kick Heroes kinda is. Thrillville lets you build the theme park of your dreams, but everyone else's nightmares. And Portal 2 is... Portal 2, man. I don't know what you can say about it at this point. We've all played it, but if by some miracle you haven't, well, now you can. PS Plus games for the month definitely do not disappoint. For the PS5, you're getting Toem. I know this is going to disappoint a lot of people since it's far from a AAA blockbuster, but this is actually a really nice little title. I played it. It's a photography-themed adventure and puzzle game. Wonderful art, clever puzzles, tightly written. It's a small package, but it's definitely worth your time. Outside of that, Grand Blue Fantasy Versus is an anime fighter, and Need for Speed Heat is apparently really good. A real return to form for the franchise, according to most of the reviews, and hopefully something to whet our appetites ahead of the rumored Need for Speed game arriving later this year. That was the PS Plus lineup, but don't forget we've also got the PS Extra lineup if you've signed up for that extra tier. Very strong showing this month, headlined by Deathloop, which I did not enjoy, but a lot of people liked it, so there you go. AC Origins is there, Watch Dogs 2, Dragon Ball Xenoverse 2, Spiritfarer, Farewell well edition and the excellent chicory a colory tale that was on many game of the year lists last year not one to miss finally twitch prime while sony are letting you play assassin's creed odyssey as part of their subscription service uncle jeff is giving it to you so long as you're a twitch prime subscriber that's not all though football manager 2022 is in the mix as is shadow of mordor which is interestingly timed given that amazon are doing everything in their power to pump their rings of power tv show which they spent a billion dollars on and they really want to make sure they get their money back all that and more is up on twitch prime right now go and grab it before it disappears at the end of the month our feel good story for the week takes us to a world that i'm sure most of us are unfamiliar with farming equipment recently we're all pretty pissed off to learn that bmw are charging a subscription fee for seat warmers Thanks, Todd. Your legacy lives on. As reported by PC Gamer, it turns out this sort of thing is actually really common in the world of farming equipment, since manufacturer John Deere has an effective monopoly, and they don't let farmers repair their own equipment. They essentially lock farmers out of the equipment that they own with complicated software, and the only people who can fix it is John Deere technicians, who of course require payment for their services. At a recent security convention in Las Vegas called DEF CON, an Australian hacker by the name of Sick Codes demonstrated that it was possible to jailbreak the control unit on a John Deere tractor, and he did it in the most awesome way possible, by getting it to run a farming-themed modded version of Doom. That's right, calculators, refrigerators, and treadmills can all run Doom, and to that list, you can now add tractors. The mod was courtesy of New Zealand-based modder Skelligant, and I really think it belongs in a museum, because using a modded version of Doom to publicly shame a billion-dollar corporation into treating farmers better is very based. We shouldn't forget that anytime soon. And that's the show, ladies and gents. Like I said, Friends Per Second is going up this weekend on the channel. I may have a little preview up this week as well for a little title I'm excited about. Definitely a lot of content hitting over the next few weeks and months as we descend into the madness of the release season. So if you want to be here for it, then be sure to hit the subscribe button and ding the notification bell. If for some unknown reason you happen to have enjoyed this video, then please do drop it a like. That always helps me out in a big way. Thank you as always for your time. And a big thank you to this week's sponsor, Squarespace. All right, so I don't know if any of you are interested in making gaming content or doing games journalism or whatever, but if you are interested in that and you're finding it tough to get a foot in the door somewhere, then can I suggest you start writing? I write about 12,000 words a week, and I feel one of the reasons I've been able to make it on YouTube is because I write rather than just talking into a microphone. I'm not saying that's the only way to do it, by the way. I mean, most of the biggest YouTubers in any category are doing it unscripted, but writing works for me because it helps me organize my thoughts and it gives me the chance to phrase things exactly how I want them to be phrased. If you're interested in doing any writing, but you've got no one to publish you, then maybe think about starting a blog, just a space where you can put your thoughts down on a page, share them with people, maybe even have something to point to if you do ever apply for a job somewhere. 
If you want to start a blog, then you might want to think about Squarespace. They have an end-to-end -end blog creation template that guides you through the process of setting up a professional-looking blog, helps you publish and promote your work through both email subscriptions and SEO tools, and they have analytics tools so you'll know which of your content is resonating best with your readers. It's super simple to start up. You don't need any experience whatsoever in building a website, and it just lets you start practicing a craft while putting something out into the world so that you can spark a conversation with others or create opportunities opportunities for yourself. As I mentioned earlier, Squarespace are a long-running partner of this channel, three years running now actually. I really appreciate that support. Squarespace are helping me turn my passion into a career and that's what they do for a lot of people because if you want to turn your passion into a career, then a website is a really good place to start. To get started, visit squarespace.com and if you really want to get serious, visit squarespace.com forward slash skill up to get 10% off your purchase of a website or a domain name. Thanks Squarespace for sponsoring the video and thank you for watching it.